Thank you. Um, so um, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna read some work from the novel Frequency of Magic, but I'm gonna set it up a little bit first. Um, I don't want you to when I'm setting it up to think, well, what does this have to do with rhythm? Hopefully, it will become clear by the end of it. Um, so uh, the American great late great American black American poet uh, Amiri Baraka has an interesting quote. Um, in which he says, to name something is to wait for it in a place you think it will pass. Um, and I say that because it's, it's, it's kind of how I came upon this idea which forms a sort of the, the central idea behind the book. Um, you know, I've been writing for many years uh, since I was a child and experimenting with, with, with forms, experimenting with ideas, experimenting with a range of um, approaches. Um, and along that journey, occasionally I come across ideas which kind of concretize or, or solidify what I was doing, and I go, oh, so that's what I was doing. That happened to me with, with surrealism. I'd been writing for many years and then uh, found an affinity with surrealist writers and realized that I was, I was essentially a surrealist writer. Um, and then in 2014, I was in Trinidad. I was invited to do a, a festival, literature festival out there. And I attended a lecture by a, a Trinidadian novelist called Earl Lovelace, who is one of our main uh, novelists. Not just a novelist, a philosopher, um, cultural theorist. Earl tends to write, I mean, you can Google him. You can Google Earl Lovelace. You can Google everything. <laughs> but um, Lovelace is in his 80s. He writes a novel every 10 years. Um, so he doesn't have a lot of novels. Um, but he was giving a, a lecture, or a, a workshop it was supposed to be, on fiction. It was just fiction. It, it ended up not really being a lecture, but more of a conversation. Um, Earl is unique in that uh, most Caribbean writers, like myself included, tend to leave the Caribbean at some point in order to make a living because you know making a living as a poet in Trinidad or you know a novelist in the Caribbean is is not really a thing. It doesn't really happen. You you struggle financially. So a lot of us leave uh, and I'm sure you know the whole history of the Windrush and people coming here since the 30s and 40s. Um, but Earl decided that he was going to stay in Trinidad. So he stayed in Trinidad and as he would say caught his ass, in other words, suffered financially, but managed to carve a, a, a career out for himself. So his writing is really centered in the community. Uh, he's a big influence in me. Anyway, at this uh, workshop he was giving, he said, one of the interesting things he said was that Caribbean writers need to find a form. We need to find ways of writing and ways of approaching form that mirror our experiences as Caribbean people. He was saying uh, that one of those one of those things we need to do is to write a narratology, write it in a in a way that reflects the experience that that we have and the experience for him of the Caribbean life, especially life in Trinidad. For anyone that's been uh, or haven't been, you should go. Um, but for him, the Caribbean experience is simultaneous. It's it's about simultaneity. You know, he talks about if you're having a conversation with someone on the street here, someone else is calling your name, someone is blowing a horn, someone is having a fight with their neighbor, someone is, you know, there's all these sorts of things happening. And for him, it's important to be able to include all of that within the story. Um, and it's true, you know, being in Trinidad, being in the Caribbean, there must, there might be something about the weather or something about the, just the atmosphere that you feel a, a, a real heightened sense of sensory experience, real heightened sensory overload at times. There's too much going on. Um, now, while this idea of a simultaneous experience cannot, is not something that the Caribbean can claim as its own, I mean, of course, every experience in a way is polyphonic. At any one time, many things are happening. We're in this room and there's stuff happening on the outside. And many writers experiment with this, with this, with, with this idea. But I think in Western fiction, primarily, usually that extra stuff happens off the screen. It happens 
It happens outside of the page. It doesn't really happen within the page. Uh, it happens sometimes in the subplot, but we're told that you can't have too many of these. Um, but by and large, this, this sort of uh, kaleidoscope experience, this stuff, this stuff of, of things happening all at once and uh, things happening on top of each other, is kind of kept away from mainstream fiction. Um, probably because the emphasis on a lot of um, contemporary, contemporary or sort of classic fiction even, is on a heroic figure and transformation, the transformation of a character who the reader follows and grows with. It's really about the rise of the individual, what we might call the protagonist, what we might call the main character or the hero, or what Lovelace would call the star boy. But when you begin to dismantle the system of linearity, it also affects the way you work with characters. The characters in the novel, in the novels change. The characters in the fiction change. Um, I have a quote here that I want to, I want to, I want to read. It's from uh, an academic called Hedda Russell, who's an American writer. Uh, just to sort of support this point, she says, "Conventional literary forms take shape in accord." with widely agreed upon rules or social contracts. Breaking such traditional or canonical social contra contracts becomes integral to the liberating revolutionary poet of form and uh, poet, sorry, revolutionary poetry of form engendered by African Atlantic narratology. Grand narratives of enlightenment, rationalism, and civilization are quintessentially linear. They chronicle a seemingly ordained movement from proverbial darkness to transcendent light, from unknowingness to certain knowledge, from formlessness to perfect form. Such linearity, coupled with its uh, imperatives, attends as well to the discourses of slavery, white supremacy, and colonialism. African Atlantic narratives seek often and persistently to formally disrupt linear prescriptive constructions. So this is what people like Earl are doing, not just Earl, but uh, someone like Una Brodbar, uh, someone like um, Marlon James, um, someone like Samuel Selborne even. This is what uh, we've been engaged in doing, disrupting the linearity of the text as a, in a, a political impetus, not just to say, okay, we're experimenting with the text and we're trying to find another way of telling a story. We're trying to find, a, to find a way of telling the story which reflects the experience that we've had uh, as Caribbean people. Um, when you begin to consider the fact that the Caribbean is, is a product uh, partly of, of plantation slavery, um, the migration of multitudes of people in and out of the region, you begin to see why this is important and why this had to be, why there had to be a form of writing which reflected that experience. Um, anyway, I was talking about the, the fact that once you start disrupting this linearity, it affects the way you, you write your characters. What happens is that your characters become less you, you become less focused on one individual character. Suddenly, you begin to write and everyone has a voice. Every character in your novel wants to have equal weight, equal standing. There's not one main protagonist. There's, there's many protagonists. Um, the characters on the periphery are saying, what about me? Uh, they, they will not sit and be quiet. So in all my novels, I had to wrestle with this idea. Um, I mean, I say all my novels. I've only got like, like a few, a small amount. But in the African Origins of UFOs, which was the first novel that, I, that was published for me, it was published in 2006, I think, um, I wanted to tell a story that spanned eons, that spanned a huge amount of time from almost prehistory into outer space in the year 3053 or whatever. So I devised this way of telling it where there were 24 chapters and it was divided into books of three. There were three, there were one book in the past, one book in the future, and one book in the present. And the story went in and out. So you read the future, the present, the past, the future, the present, the past, the future, the present, the past throughout the 24 chapters. So you ended up with like a quilting thing going on where the narratives leapt across chapters. 
but you kept, if you read carefully, you could keep a hold on it. Uh, this for me was a way of disrupting linearity and finding a way of telling a, a very Caribbean story. Um, and then, uh, which brings me to fre the frequency of magic, which is what I'm going to read from tonight. Um, I think what it does is take Lovelace's ideas of, um, first of all, breaking the sort of linear structure of a narrative and creating something which is more polyphonous and simultaneous, but also looking at characterization and how that is affected and the fact that you can have multiple main characters. Which, uh, if any, any creative writing students here will be like, no, this, this no. <laughs> um, but it works. It works. Um, so yeah, the frequency of magic. I'll, re I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a sec. But uh, just to sum up this, this idea, you know, it's, it's really a way of saying uh, I'm we are creating a site-specific form that reflects the experience of the Caribbean, Caribbean people. Um, if art is a reflection of a people's history and culture, then the diaspora by nature and by its historicity is bound to produce a narrative form which reflects the experience of freedom, of group struggle, of collective effort. So the focus is not on an individual heroic figure. The focus is on a community of voices and how they contribute and how they produce narrative. Um, I have a novel actually that's coming out in June, which is a, a book on a, calyp a calypso singer called Lord Kitchener, um, which I'm not going to read from tonight. But the way I approach that is kind of a similar way in that the story is told not by Lord Kitchener, but by everyone else that knew him. So there's just a collective of voices that are telling the story of a man. And you get a really rounded picture of him, which is very honest, because he doesn't, he's not allowed to say, no, that didn't happen. Everyone is just talking about it. Um, so hopefully you get a rounded picture of him. So the frequency of magic, um, I, I, I've been, I worked in this for about two years. It started as an idea. I was on the bus, actually. Um, <laughs> sounds kind of weird. I was, I was on a bus, I read on the BBC that Amiri Baraka had died, and I started writing, and one of the lines that I came up with was this frequency of magic. And then when I sort of interrogated it for what it actually meant, what it means to me is that, you know, um, poetry, for me, the poetic essence, the poetic moment, occurs within a frequency. And that frequency, for me, is a frequency of magic. Um, Sometimes you read a poem, you read a line, and it takes your breath away, and for a moment you're kind of suspended. That is the frequency of magic. Uh, it's the same as when a magician does a trick, pulls a rabbit out of a hat or makes someone disappear. In that split second, you're in a frequency, you're in a particular frequency, you're in a zone in which this is possible. And that's for me, is the frequency of magic. Um, so this novel kind of takes this idea of multiple simultaneity uh, and um, a range of characters to another level in that not only are the, each chapter giving you another strand of a bigger narrative, but sometimes these narratives are breaking through within the text, it's within the, the chapters themselves. So line by line, you can go from one idea into another narrative, um, which sounds very confusing, and it is. But uh, it's art, can I say? Um, yeah, so the basic premise behind the book is that there is a man in Trinidad on a hill who's a, a butcher by trade, old guy, probably in his 60s, 70s, and he's writing a book, he's been writing a novel for 41 years, and he's not very good, he's not a very good writer, so it's taken him a long time to finish this book, and the characters have gotten really bored of just sitting around in this novel for 40 years. They're like, man, well, we gotta get out of this. So they devise a way, they find a way out of the text and begin to have their own lives, their own experiences. And this, the, the novel is about these experiences that these characters have outside of the book, but it's also about his creative process and the man who's, the guy is called Raphael, his process in trying to rein the book in. He has no idea what these characters are up to because he never reads back. 
He just keeps riding forward. So he has no idea what these characters are doing behind his back. Um, yeah, turns the page, he writes, so he has no idea what's going on there. Uh, he writes a thousand words a day. Each chapter is a thousand words long. He writes a, a thousand words a day and moves on and has no idea what's going on until the end when he may read back. So I'm going to read some uh, excerpts from this. I'm going to start with the first uh, chapter. So as I said, every, every chapter is a thousand words long. You're welcome to count, see if I'm lying. <laughs> um, this is the first chapter. The old man had been writing a novel for 41 years. His house of water and his house of chairs. On a cedar table amongst ornaments, trinkets, and books of Eden's apocrypha lay his papers. But the bull cow would ramble, the sour cherry would bear fruit, the madman would jump, the ravine would need to be cleared, the cutlass fish would flip and succumb to air, suspended there in that hairy aviary, distractions were plentiful. So he wrote in the latrine, away from the dissonance of the million hills, secluded in the blistering skin of shit amidst the deep hurling scent of ammonium and banks of dank moss where women stooped to piss. Moan, papa moan, and write your book. But bugs, bees, and red ants come to bite his ankle. The drake duck crows in the valley. The deacon rings the bell in the church hidden bush. A phone rings in the falling down house. The milk cow tumbles. The mongoose chases the hairy snake. The cat breaks its claw. The Baptist mother delays her thanksgiving to cuss somebody upside down. <laughs> so even in the shit house came things to inveigle and addle the old man's brain, to distract him from his craft. After 41 years, the novel's characters were understandably restless. Some were elderly, some were dead. Some like Vince and Giveaway, who as boys would pitch marbles in the self-indulgent riverbeds of the imagined city, had simply <clears throat> faded into the spaces between words. Ramdas, shoplift, and court and heart attacked right there in the station when police hold him. Noel Denny, a turnkey, got fired for weed. And Luke, protagonist and prince of the text, get damn vexed one day and ride out of the pages like a thief. The book the old man was writing was his masterpiece, his book of life. His name was Raphael. He was a butcher, and he lived high upon the million hills, behind the wooden nursing home and the credit union. There was a young boy in the village who would arrive at the old man's house blowing a transverse bamboo flute which he had carved from grief and luck, bare bone and onyx stone. He was Raphael's great nephew, and he wore short khaki pants. His head was copper-scented, and he lay his colo vertically in those days, level against the zip. He was awkward and reticent. He would sit with Raphael on the veranda, overlooking the deep well of ours and the glass jungles of the rainforest. Beyond lay the still dark sea, and beyond even this, the edge of the known world. The maps of their world had been drawn by eminent cartographers who had underestimated the island's size. Fireside by night, Raphael and the boy roasted cashew beans while the old man recreated each tale anew, fiction assuming the image and lung of the dreaming world. Raphael in his gallery, rubbing Bairam on his knees, was then deep into fiction, writing and rewriting the same opening lines, then months later, the concluding sentence of the second great chapter. Raphael told tales of hunting in the hills, of working on cargo ships as a young sailor, how he was handsome like a bitch, and how every morning he would rise and fire a rum to start the day. His working papers were tattered. They had been written on and over again for palimpsest, where the true text is hidden within the ink and flutter. Sometimes Raphael would read from his novel, in which multiple stories occurred simultaneously. It was called the frequency of magic. But the characters and their impatience had broken needles under Raphael's fingernails. They had penetrated his brain with complaints, and their eyes saw sky hooks and penetrative timbers of light and destiny. Then his wife died. The sand tore into the sponges of her lungs. 
Then the wind blew her away. Grapes had filled them, bursting, like in Hilo supermarket in Barataria, when as a young man he had a packing job for summer and burst delicate grapes in customers' bags, in white shirt and soft pants, behind the engines of commerce and cash transactions. This went on until one day he was hungry and stole a tin of Viennese sausages and was scoped by a cashier who told, and the boss man, Gary, called him up to the office and said, Raphael, boy, you know what's going to happen now, eh? Raphael had built himself a tough chapel to write in. The soak away first, and then in the latrine, where the galvanized stuck like roots into the mud, that bug-ridden mud, his notebooks held open on his knees while flies buzzed around his heel and head like constellations. But the rain beat him to a print. The vehicle skidded and overturned on a rugged Tobago road. The minister was caught masturbating on a rock behind the school till candle wax dripped. The pie man was strangled with a, with a shoelace, pulling bull up Santa Cruz. The parrot cussed and was arrested and charged. The lizard hit, hid in the Malomere bush. In his grandmother's house, there were black instruments for breaking hymens. The woman turned into a blackbird and fell burning from the power line. The one-eyed fish went totally deaf. The book would overwhelm him. It wouldn't listen. The characters became unruly, ungrateful, bottle break, table turnover. Then fragmentation of the text and the leaking eye. By night, by paraffin, lamplight, people fighting. Some grinning like crapo when the man trying to write. It's like the damn book was writing him. But when he read from this book, well, those were the nights. Patchouli, sage bush, and pea shell wine. Even Mr. Crapple would come and sit down on Big Stone to hear the old man read this thing. It was to be an important book. Raphael had put all his belly and his stones into it. It would be his legacy. Su generis. So what I've done is just select random. There's no, there's no sense reading you... Uh, which chapter as they come, because it doesn't really matter. It's a kind of book I guess you can read out of uh, sequence. So one of the things I, I usually do is say, give me a number between 1 to 100. I, I'm not going to do that today, because I don't have the whole book here. But uh, I'm going to read you... Um, this is chapter... Okay, this is chapter 68. So... Um, yeah, I'm not going to try to explain this, man. It's, uh, but in Trinidad, when I was growing up, this is one thing I'll explain about this particular uh, chapter. Um, grief milk. There's, it's a chapter called Grief Milk. When I was growing up, when I was a child, um, my grandmother always used to talk about this idea, this thing called grief milk. And when she explained it to me, what it is, is it's when a woman... Uh, has a child or is, is pregnant and is about to have a child and the child dies. And the child dies like within days of being born or whatever or, or is even still born and the milk uh, has already been begun to produce in her breast and it has nowhere to go. That is called grief milk and that apparently causes women a lot of, a lot of agony, both mental and physical agony. Um, so this is where this idea comes from. But this grief milk thing, nobody know the suffer else he suffer under that house. Eating dirt and matted hair and rags that ants bite up. And toilet paper that wood slave or salamander black and white shit on chicken wire. They leave she down there to do her business. They leave Elsie down there to dead. It is July 1957. Motocar still curvy. Fellas still wearing flannel leg pants and women still wearing calico dress. Sparrow come with Jack Palance and Elsie down there below that house in Barataria for two weeks now. From family bring her after her one child dead at five days old and poor Elsie milk come in and burst. The milk stay full up her breast and can't feed her baby so it must water out to irrigate the world. To be squeezed into a young man's eye, to cleanse cataract, to seep out sticky and white. Grief milk, they call this milk. 
And when the milk turned to blood, Elsie crawled under that house and wouldn't come out. Down in the dirt, she grew a beard and ate so much dirt, her dress brought dried to wood. Who will be worried? Who will care? Who will dig Elsie out from under this tragedy? The old man washing his cock in the sink? The civil servant beating his owl stations with a black police belt? The cousin who was a promising athlete until big books like Lacan and Deleuze resumed drove him mad? The woman upstairs in the Calypso ballroom in Champs Flair grinding malice because her husband seeing the same hard black woman that feeding him egg bread and green yam for 30 years. The bareback tailor sewing silver masquerade boots obliquely opposite the Royal Jail on Frederick Street and could tell you how dense with gallows cry some mornings this be. The cameraman obsessed with taking photos of the old fort, the old port, the cathedral, the market with his fisheries scent. The same one who watching the young boy prick and plum and pick him out to skin him up on a hairy rock in short pants for photograph. The woman who escaped heavy poverty on the hill, who lived in a hole in the ground until she hook up the heart of a German pensioner as a chambermaid at Hilton Hotel and moved to Caracas with the old test. Later to glean, he was a wanted man with gun under bed and criminal past in Germany. But she never tell nobody, expecting long money. But his 32 Fats Domino albums he leave her instead. The hundred year old aunt still grinding sugar with her teeth and chewing blue fly from a scar on her thigh that never heals. No. Not even the hard prick priest in the falling down church where people passing out from rhythm and heat. Not even the orange vendor in Cantaro Junction who's selling sideways weed, or the fishman Melchior, or the barber in the village who know how to fix up when fellas skull plate showing. Maybe the local opera singer who feel that black people can't tell if he's singing in tune. No, nobody will care, will care for poor Elsie. Not even the shit snake or the mongoose fleeing fire, or the blackbird waiting for rice and superstition, or the boy with the whip that cutting lizards in two. Look, their thick back bursting. And so left to eat dirt till it pack up her gut, Elsie get mad like a jumbie in that cage, and hiss and biting people ankle when they pass. The butcher, Raphael, seeing her plight, and fed up hear her cry at night, Fling some mercy her way. He let go a hose under there and wash away cockroach and scorpion nest. Lumps of cement with chicken wire remain there from long ago way of building with mud and bush. From capsized truck and building work with Mr. Tom in Tobago. It wash out worm in old wood from leftover carpentry work. But Elsie refused to leave. And she keeping the man from his work. Every time he sit down to write, he hear it Elsie moan. And she is family. A distant cousin, but still he can't turn her away, so he lego mercy again. He invite Elsie to sing jazz in a little Sunday band he was blowing trumpet in. But she failed. Her singing was bad. Must be dirt eat out her throat. He try her in the butchery to cleave goat meat from bone, but she flinging blade like sorrow self and junking up the people goat meat. So he put her in the book he was writing. He put her under a house to eat dirt, but Elsie still wouldn't behave. She vexed like crab, only watching Raphael cut eye and cussing. She wouldn't bend to the ark, she hardened, she wants she own way. She see men like Luke and the sax boy run out and explore, so Elsie want to venture out too. So when the old man put her to sit down, she's skinning up leg and cussing like old hag. She tearing up heart, she never wear shoes. Elsie will teeth meat out from cane cutter teeth, cigarette out from Calypsonian mouth, money out the reverend hand. It wasn't until Raphael buy her a sailor dress and put her in a Buddy Williams dance that she started to revive and act decent. Now she washing her mouth out with baking soda and bathing daily with a rosemary bush. Now Elsie cut her hair and taking studio pose on long stool. Now she become a parable for change in the book Raphael writing. 
Did she make Raphael realize that women like her could not be contained? They must run amok and cry out. They must stand up in Central Market and drag cutlass across their navel. They must pump engine and drive taxi. They must draw pension to support lazy men who get in big like robots. So I'm going to change the, the syntax for a bit. There are times, I mean, one of the things I'm really interested in, I guess as a poet that, you know, that's been writing, that's been writing a, a, a number of years, is that I'm interested in how far you can stretch uh, syntax and language um, and still retain a sense of a rhythm and a sense of, of uh, a meaning. Uh, so a lot of the work, I mean, you might have heard a lot of the sentences kind of run into each other and the syntax is broken and it's grammatically incorrect. Uh, purpo it's purpose, purposefully. This is uh, chapter 98. Yeah, I'll probably only read this and one more after. So, let's see. In which, considering the lack of genealogical record, we plant ourselves as roots, which function as aesthetic recourse to simultaneity, and which can be made greater with music, which may accumulate to maximum income. The native elements which are gratuitous and barely matched by catalogue or sustained by conflict, since this is drama of powerful imagery and abstraction or opera as disputatious yet unsuited to discourse and without instrument or mutual involvement is inexact science and false upon each word or gesture or sign which we would neither exaggerate or improvise upon. Then so be it, and let us go home, we cannot easily be possessed by short lines of the dramatic, since somebody else is putting that screen there, that envelope, yellow metal binds, and we may have to vote or tremble in that light adhesive, in a genre no one knew. And I saw its palatable excursion, and it was hard to love and be born at the same time. As this trend and fierce as her name was thereupon something else was alive, or ask him, he knows, how to probe the instrument that you have there. And everything has or had a growl and would die in water or defy to expose and become an act of contagion or intrigue within political or typhoon regions, deep in dialect bush or swing praxis that music would be extending by adding six horns and harmonic cycles of hymn, rhythm, and isla, who seems to loop and regulate the unsaved and rural dynamic governed by this tendency to warp and react to the orthodox poetics of grass and river and bird and tree and hollow down where the Indian cousins have built their home flat on the earth as secular sound liberated from history or the spectacle of black spirit duality transforms them with mutability and they evolve from struggle and synthesis from free jazz and mourning and hard bop and lightning hopkins's akpala hip shake hip snake iron and skin goat skin silk and death is not visible its function is different from its form image of guinea and loas of riverless bridges and talcum fog in this cult of cargo and large candles used for sacrifice, which in its first act becomes a masked dancer, then in its second as an orchestra of furious speed, which may be overflowing with terrible bees and coal. But now remember that the word must precede its image, like an object exists before its reflection in a mirror. And the word awaits the idea, the sermon and the masquerade, the sacred and the pornographic legs twisted in ecstasy, the deacon and the big-breasted woman, the deacon, the demon, and the deep well and hollow over the hills, and the humble moon when all is given and nothing returns, and somewhere the sweet wind must be sweeter, somewhere since here is only poor folk. And when it rained, the earth slippery, like some metaphor for poverty, but nobody had them lips. The cry was an insignia abstracted by flying in some mysterious way 
or to be known 200 feet away on icy mornings in which he had been to Europe, bedazzled by the rich dyed dim navigating the heat of days, ten years good and careless in dance halls, and naturally sudden, he tore up children packed in white light, drunk tea, something drew away from instruction to photographs, almost glancing, but unknown to her husband, thinking of the police, you wait there with potential. As if it were then by the greenhouse, calmly in suitcase vanguards, or in green spaces left above streets for the kind to return to hedges. And the vicarage fair dead and temple mystery as Orpheus, he studied Greek myth and meter, knew that the original Cossacks tends to favor knew the wild beast defines how the meteor is her confession and splendor perhaps you have a similar vein that we value and yet there exists in some restless imagination brown suede horsemen which carried her authentic personality until she was remembered and explored in literary magazines separated from falsehood as a character of words the Pritterite might have imposed on Coltrane, for instance. Carefully loaded a linguistic surface or form of speech from the less ambiguous reality image, which alone is hardly the sociological intention of language. In no word wrapped was she more than jumble. Hardly the sigh of a thing this gaze is an axiological weight the ambiguity of the classical period which transforms into positive art having children surrounded by masks and photographs of her early life is part of ourselves like a film from birth to death and time expires terrifying that freedom into intoxication because it cannot transcend the physical which has expressed itself in perplexity and undergone the rigors of evolution in forest and rain and sound is perceived between both planes weaknesses of the body and innermost mystic image of a language maybe meaning or epoch or glossolalia when folklore is imminent then discourse exerts its growth its grotesque image in novelistic prose each image is utterance is defiance is definitive is horizon <clears throat> is collapse is grist is sand pit an electric horn each has aspects of romance and is indissoluble and subsequent and can only provide the capacity by cunning they have merged into a lexical burden language is already such an empirical method I was not moved I simply merged with the most varied discourse of eroticism and response in limbic transference and threatening to blossom into modernist sorrow, so ostentatious and assimilated into neverness, then fitted for higher work as a drunken boatswain of the southern lakes, be buried deep beneath the vinegar tree that the magnet root in their network of silence reveals a religious prison completely obscured by the sun by its bright and efficient machine creating meaning and beauty like a suffix of green rivers where white flash the sun to glint the water pulsing with white light as simultaneous as music i think i'm going to read one more piece because i don't think i could read much more <laughs> so um it's what's an interesting me, with me for that, and it's a thousand words, you know, you're welcome to check, it sounds like a lot more, it's like, God, when is this guy going to finish, but it's like, uh, one of the things that working to, uh, uh, this sort of stipulation, which is something I guess I inherited from uh, the, um, uh, what was these guys, these French dudes, the Ulipo movement, where you sort of have stipulations, you know, you write, I'm going to write a chapter that has no letter B in it, or I'm going to write a, a chapter in which each word has five, five letters or whatever. Um, I really like that way of writing because it forces you to condense your language. It forces you to edit the language in such a way that every word earns its place. You know, as poets, we deal with this material, these words. So each word in this has to earn its place. It's like putting a, a, a jigsaw puzzle together. Uh, so I, I really enjoy working like that with these sort of confines. And it also creates, you know, since we're talking about rhythm today, it also creates a really sort of polyphonic and jumpy rhythm, just naturally, because you put so much, there's so much energy 
linguistic energy condensed in this small space. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to read uh, one more, which I think is just a light, more lighter piece, if that's possible. I mean, you know. Um, yeah, cool. I haven't read this, uh, this before, so I'm going to read it. Uh, right. This is uh, chapter 75. Raphael decided to write his own death. So that when he did die, apart from his wood and his papers and the gun drawer full of colonial letters embossed with marvelous stamps, and the old red money and the copper, they would find the unfinished manuscript of the book he was writing for 41 years. They would discover that he was sick and never told, preferring to suffer in the wound of silence alone, fear to tell, because to say might make it real, sudden make it tangible. Say a word and its potential splendor is imprinted upon the palimpsest of etheric experience. Say the word Telluride, for instance, and burst into sores and cracked lips, because that word records somewhere and will be actualized. Among his flannel trousers and jock straps, they would find volumes of his juvenilia, volumes of finely wrought but indul indul indulgently unpublished poetry. They would be impressed by his bibliography, Blacks of Eden, The Desire of Ages, The Phenomenology of Perception, The Sickness Unto Death, The Book of Questions, How to Write Black Poetry. There were celebrated texts by Lovelace, Naipauls, and Nichols. There were collected poems by Morris and Braithwaite, even Eric Roach selected, Louise Bennett collected. There were solid collections by Malika Booker and Roger Robinson. Even cult and decidedly fetish texts such as Anthony Joseph Terragaton, Birdhead Sun, Rubber Orchestras, and the African Origins of UFOs. They find books by Paul Keynes Douglas and Dr. Hollis Liverpool. Then Amy Césaire, Benitez Rojo, and Nancy Morihon come in. Long black books for the colonization of the mind. And in the living room where Raphael kept his vinyl stacked alphabetical and vast, the map would be full with over 500,000 albums, all notated in full scaff folios and collated and separated into genre and flung against the flash of sunlight on shelves. Elvin Jones, Hot Lips Page, John Clemmer to exhale and blow gauge, Roshan with arms of Vishnu on stretch, manzello, and nose flute. All the species of sax and reed machines, hard US card and black inside, black saint and the sinner lady, the lauded Sabu series, Strata East, black jazz and monk plays Isla, even Ellington's Afro Bossa, Robert Aaron's Trouble Man, Woody Shaw, Joy Division, Closer, Adam Purenzik and Alan Shorter, Amina Claudine, and Endless Calypso. People would say, wow, this man have jazz knocking dog, meaning a vast amount. Raphael had collected these from trips to New York, some from local stores overcome by floods and salvaged by hustlers to be sold waterlogged on Frederick Street, now cleaned and immaculately kept Lord. Even his own kin would be cussed to concussions if they touched this grail while he was alive. Researchers would also discover several pairs of shoes under his bed, gray leatherette brogues with crumpled heels, grave digger boots with blades for sharpening toes, the slippers he wore when cutting the bull cow seeds. In the backyard, the cattle and swine would be reprieved. They would not be slaughtered, but be let out of their muddy pens to go roam over hill and river, and yet to be snared in traps and bled out of oil by hunters. And any characters left within the manuscript would be sent down to the shop by prodigal kin to buy cigarettes, condensed milk, and margarine or cut down in their primes with plans and opinions, be beaten for stealing avocados, be slit open in other slaughteries to have their kidneys roasted and served with vintage pepper, to be, eaten, to be beaten with a white pine floorboard while washing the duck pen, 
to leap out of the hot water bucket and skip out and flutter with neck slit and smelling of death, wet and warm and feathers to be punctured with harpoons and bruised with nunchakus, to be hung from the neck and spun. The house will be cleared of the old man's things, his tools, the guns of his unused cartridge. His books will be boxed and forgotten in the derelict room of some cousin or aunt whose house is the only one on flat land. His records will be shared among nephews and old sagaboy dancers, entire discographies carried under their arms, like children down among the hillside, crying. His gun took his brother Bane from the random wood, who beat the foreman in, of the brewery, and escaped jail with cunning and guile, and wasn't so insane after all, and saved his money to buy bricks and put down, put down foundations, since that was the way that folks progressed in society by stacking bricks and bags of cement outside their wooden houses, as promise and ambition to be witnessed. Oh, so this one and that one building house now. But bricks build up and never amount sometimes to a whole house or latrine. Cement get hard and have to be busted by bareback laborers and ditch diggers. Brick get teeth and have to be hunted down. The butcher's knives would sit silently on a table in the yard. He would walk down in the morning and draw for the sharpest blade. In death, they were left untouched, as if they held the old man's spirit, not to be contaminated and witnessed by the living. The manuscript he had written for the frequency of magic would be flicked through by less literate cousins who were better used to hunting Maniku and Iguana, who smoked hard weed in secret so as not to offend the matriarchs and elder members of the clan, since such things were still sighed upon and denounced, unless it were sharing. The great book would not be stored among the old man's archive at some metropolitan university. Neither would it be studied in academics, in academies of literature. It would not be critiqued by scholars and journalists whose reviews were published in broadsheets. It would not be published in hardcover, nor placed on syllabuses or shelves in high houses to be read in times of famine or grief. Raphael decided to write his own death, but nothing happened. Thank you. Um, it is based on the character of Raphael is based on a, an uncle of mine who lived on a hill, who wasn't a butcher, he was a, he was a bus driver and a mechanic for many years. But when I started writing the book, I based it on him. But I didn't want him to be a mechanic, I just thought that you know, there was more scope. I, you know, I write a lot about uh, the body and the sort of, I write a lot about death, death and uh, um, how people's lives are defined by their deaths, you know. So I wanted him to have some sort of play, some role in the book, which was which involved the cutting up of, of flesh. And, sorry, hey, that's how it is. So yeah, I was I was really into that as an idea. So it, it, throughout the book, there's a lot of images of of, of him, you know, slaughtering and stuff like that. Well, it, it's interesting that that um, yeah, that the reference was a mechanic, and that you were chosen. Sounds like kind of intuitively the yeah. same sort of thing. Mm. Yeah. Like that would be um, because one, one thing that was making me think about is um, that you were talking about like the uh, the, the human uh, cut yeah. or the, the decision of each yeah. chapter having like a hundred um, sure. so there's a kind of set cut and yet uh, I, I mean with, with each reading the, the time felt different uh, obviously the the the, 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 the whole atmosphere and the frequency just yeah. was radically different. In, and so the kind of fleshiness mm -hmm. um, like within that kind of standard mm -hmm. cut was that it was, it, it was making me think. Sure. Okay. Good. That's, that was good. That was a fun one. Great. Are there questions from the audience? I've got other ones if not, but please. question really um it reads so you, you read so beautifully it sounds so perfect um 
story. And I wonder if you write that way as well, Eva. Do you, do you kind of take something down, sort of trying things out orally before you write them down? Or do you type? Do you type? I type. I yeah. type. But, you know, I, uh, I have an innate sense of rhythm. I, you know, I guess growing up in Trinidad, you know, experiencing carnival and calypso, and just the, the rhythm, of the way people speak in Trinidad is just in, it's just part of it, is my musicality. So, and I'm a poet, so I write with sound in mind, so all these things, all these, you know, things. So when I write, uh, it just automatically comes, it, it's automatically set on a stab almost. It's, all, it's just musical in that way. I, I, I usually don't have to think too much about it. When it doesn't work, it's not good. I just get rid of it. Um, oh yeah. But do you, do you try it out? The, is it important that it sounds that it sounds good? If you read it out as you go along as well. I read it in my head. Yeah. You know, or sometimes I read it on the page, but I don't write like that. It's not like a. I'm not a performance poet. Okay. So you know, I don't write for the stage. I write for the page, but I write in a way. I mean, Kim Albrightway talks about how um, we should write poetry that the, 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 we create sculpture in the air. You know. So that's what I try to do. I try to create rhythm and music that exists in the reader's air, not necessarily for performance, but yeah, for. It's quite internal, then. Yeah. 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 Fine, right, thank you for the talk. Um, so, you've expressed how your earlier years in Trinidad heavily influenced your work. I would be really curious to know how has your time in London or in the UK uh, experience uh, influenced your work as well, if at all? Mm, that's a good question. I, I, I tend to write very little about London because I always I find that. Um, I need distance in order to really know something, to really understand something. And since I'm here, well, I tend to write about the early days when I first came to the UK. I can write about that, but I can't. It's, you know, I need distance. Um, but what it, what it's done for me, you know, moving from Trinidad to here, it, it I mean, it's opened up. I mean, before I came to Trinidad, before I came to the UK, I didn't know that you could make a living as a poet. Uh, you still can't, but. Um, <laughs> You know, there are ways around it. There are ways that you can, in a way. So, I, you know, until I came here, I really didn't know what it meant to be a writer and a poet. And it, it, it allowed me access to a lot of reading, a lot of material, a lot of ideas. Um, but in terms of how it, it directly influences the world, I, I guess it's there. You know, it's, it's in there somewhere. But I don't I couldn't identify it. You know. So it's, a, it's more of an indirect influence that you can't really pinpoint? I mean, yeah, because I'm not British. I'm not English, you know. I'm not. And so I don't have um, a way of writing that is steeped in English culture. I don't have that. I don't have that. I, I didn't grow up here in the 70s and the 80s. So I can't draw on that. I grew up in Trinidad, you know. And I draw on that, in that experience. I draw on the characters that I knew, you know. What happens is that um, a lot of my experience, I mean, for instance, this book. Um, a whole narrative strand concerns a, a jazz musician that's traveling around Europe on tour and the adventures that he has. And that's very, that's very now, and that's very European. But that's because it's a reflection of my own experience as a, as a musician traveling around. So yeah, I guess that's one way that I'm doing it. Thank you. <laughs> There was a line about your characters disappearing into the spaces between words, yeah. um, and I was wondering, just as you know, you're building these sculptures in the air. If there's a sense of the image of the page, mm. because I started thinking about beyond just having hearing you read it and then kind of disappearing in between the words, but what the act of physically reading mm. the text would be like. And is there this sense of the page just enacting something for you, or is that just something that? It was a more of a device. Um, and you're mm -hmm. a poet by nature, like yeah. does does the space matter? I know you're into constrained writing, which is the coolest. <laughs> um, so, you know, does that kind of sense of poetic the space of the page apply to novels for you? Ooh. Uh, yes. I mean, um, in the sense only in the sense that I'm conscious, I guess because I'm a poet, I'm really conscious about how the text looks on the page. Um, and I know that you can manipulate how it's read and how it's how it affects people by the way it's laid out. So with this book, 
Uh, there are no paragraph links. It's just solid blocks of text. And footnotes, huge footnotes, huge sort of side panels where the text is broken up as a little panel and there's a bit of story in there, which carries on. Um, so it's manip I manipulate how it looks on the page. I think that's, I mean, I hope that that experience, but then it's not my book. I didn't write the book. Raphael wrote the book. <laughs> you know. So yeah, it's complex. So I don't know how he meant for it to be right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi, thanks. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about that kind of comes back to uh, Chris in your presentation at the beginning. We're talking about um, rhythm and togetherness, and you're talking about. Um, a sort of uh, diasporic writing as a kind of uh, collective effort. Mm -hmm. And then I'm just sort of really fascinated by the idea of this kind of non protagonist mm -hmm. authorial figure mm -hmm. who's then being in some way overrun or usurped by this <coughs> sort of lysismorphic collective multitude. Right. Yeah. So it's fun. What is the... <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that kind of was the question. Uh, <laughs> essentially, I guess something about uh, collective effort, mm. togetherness, and then this kind of like usurp strange author, because mm. the author kind of is the protagonist, but then kind of suddenly is not, but yeah. it's still sort of, mm, there's some sort of like, yeah, some, we just know what the kind of the power struggle of the text is, I guess. Yeah. Well, you know, it's like a, it's a, it's a mirror of infinity. You know, it's a mirror of infinity. It's like who's writing the book? That's, that's one of the things that I'm fascinated by. Who's, who's actually writing this book? Whose book is it? You know, is it Raphael um, that's writing the book, or is it a, who's, where, where do you locate this figure that you're talking about? Where do you locate the, the narrator? You know, can the narrator even be located? I don't know. Narr obviously, I wrote the book. I think I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's I don't know. It's it's you know I try to um, I guess be center the the idea of protagonists and the idea. I'm just trying to be center that and sort of move away from that side. So um, at any one time you dive into the book, uh, the, the sort of focus is on another character or a few characters. So that character becomes the the narrator or the central figure. So. It's constantly shifting, but uh, I, you know, for the character to become absurd, I, I kind of know what you mean. I mean, he he loses control. He's lost control. The the writer has lost control of what's going on in his book, or has he? You know. <laughs> I don't know. But it, it, it's interesting that um, the the author, the authority, um, gets kind of. Uh, I love the word this. Dysmorphic, um, the, the authority of the scripture um, mm. that, that he's seeking to, to collect it. No one can hear me. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I was just thinking the, um, uh, the, the, the uh, authority of the author um, being kind of tapped into his own text and mm. just going into the power. Mm. Mm. I think there was a question. <coughs> I uh, kind of jumped on earlier to asking this question, but I'm thinking about um, like how people in the African and also the indigenous diasporas embody the past, and it's like there's this inheritance of the past that I guess changes how we also act in the present, and there's this like also this like expansive future in the diaspora mm -hmm. and um and i was also like thinking about that phrase like island time or like yeah. people of color time like black like black and brown people yeah. time there's this like that, there's that thing and then i was gonna like my specific question was to ask are there ways that you like disrupt linearity in like a daily way that isn't related to your writing practice but you necessarily have to answer that. I guess maybe just comment on the other stuff. Um, well, I don't know. I think, I mean, well, in a philosophical way, I guess. I, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm sure we're all aware that 
um, you know, there's an idea that everything is actually happening at the same time. I mean, if you if you you experience something, you can recall it. You know, you can recall something that happened yesterday. You can bring it into your consciousness while you're experiencing the present. So, you know, in a way, we're all aware that time is a is, is kind of a fluctuating thing. Everyone has an idea in time, so I'm, I'm not going to get into that. But um, no, I mean, I, I live just like you do, you know, day by day. Um, but this idea of um, the Caribbean's attitude to, to time, is, it's an interesting one. I mean, I could only speak about the Trinidadian experience. I haven't been to all the islands to spend a lot of time. But in Trinidad, we have a, one thing that struck me about the society and the culture is that we, we tend to want to let go of the past pretty quickly. Uh, even the pleasure of the past, even things that are good, you know. We have the carnival in Trinidad, for instance, and one of the main things about carnival is Calypso. Uh, and every year, these singers produce this amazing range of Calypsos, hundreds of Calypsos. Um, and at the end of the carnival, it's almost like they get pushed aside or locked in a, locked in a cupboard, never to be heard again. When you do play them, they're like, oh, that's old shit, man. It's just like last year. But they're like, oh, I don't want to hear that. You know, it's all about the new, the new, the new, the new. The new, the idea of the new is really important in Trinidad. Um, the, which is why, if you go there, there is one vintage shop in the whole of the country. <laughs> There's one shop that sells the vintage clothes and records and stuff like that. It's my favorite shop. I got a lot of records there. But that shows you what the culture is like, that we're not into secondhand and we're not into the old world. It's the idea of the new, I guess, you know, it must come from you know, plantation slavery, you know, and sort of trying to always forge ahead and create something new to create, create, create a new life, a new experience. I think that's part of what it is. Uh, plus, you know, there's, there's a lot of creativity in places like that. People are very creative, so they push the old out very quickly. Hi, I was just wondering, um, because you do poetry and music, if you can, um, are there any obvious parallels that you draw between the two, or methods of working, or the way they express themselves? Yeah, mm. creatively. I, I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't separate it. For me, poetry is music. For me, poetry is just spoken music, you know. Uh, music is, is po there's a poetic element to music. We speak sometimes the same language, you know. We speak about stanzas, or bars, or verses, or, or rhythm, and meter. It's it's like that because it's it's a very similar art. You know, when I when I work with musicians, it's the same process. It's the same process as writing a poem and making it fit in a particular structure. Um, there's a and I think there's a I mean there's a saying that all art aspires to the condition of music. Music for me is like the, the sort of pinnacle of things. It's what everything wants to become like. You know, poetry wants to be like music, and poetry for me is the closest of the art forms that gets to that level of, of musicality, meaning um, something that could affect you at the shortest distance be between the, the thing and you. You know, it's the short, it's a very short distance. You can hear something and instantly feel it. And if you write a really good poem, you can do that too, you know. It's not like um, fiction where you have to digest and think about it and, you know. Uh, with poetry and music, the processing time is, is brief, and I think that for me is what's always connected the two. You know, the shortness of the poem, you can see it in that. It, it, it wants to grab you like that. So I don't separate that. Really extraordinary. Um, if you'll forgive me, a kind of literary theory question. <laughs> um, I'm, I was quite curious to pick up on your discussion of minor characters and to try to kind of um, extend that conversation a little bit to maybe sort of try to situate it um, with respect to several different ways that the importance of minor characters has been understood in various contexts. So when you talked about the minor characters kind of um, speaking at the edges of the text and saying, hey, yeah. what about me? I was immediately struck um, 
by this affinity with uh, Alex Wolock's book, The One Versus the Many, in which he argues that uh, characters, minor characters in 19th century novels are the proletariat of the novel. Uh, their minorness sort of pulls on the, the kind of, um, the, the privileging of one particular character. It seeks to, uh, it seeks a kind of egalitarianism to come. It seeks to kind of dissolve narrative attention, but also to draw attention to the economy mm -hmm. of narrative attention. Sure. Um, and so one of the, there, there's this, that, that's a certain way of thinking about minorness, uh, minoritarianism in, in writing as a, as a kind of class politics in a way. Um, for someone like Raquel Bakhtin, uh, the polyphonic character, the character that um, is able to speak dialogically, to speak with a sense that any one voice is always shot through with many voices, that language originates from nowhere, that it always is a refrain, a repeat. Um, those are the characters that have, um, and, and for Bakhtin, it's you know, Dostoevsky's characters, uh, they have the most um, freedom. They, they, they're sort of given a kind of autonomy from their own uh, authors, and that also struck me very much uh, as an affinity with your work. But I kind of wondered if your own, um, and, and of course there's the kind of Deleuzean, sort of Kafka, minoritizing, you know, novels as minoritizing uh, language discourse as well. But I was kind of wondering if your take on the minor in writing has something a little bit more to do with the object world as well. And I was really struck by the way that your narrative sort of laterally cuts across uh, people, body parts, mm -hmm. objects, materials, to try to, uh, you know, kind of create a chorus that's, that's really not only human. Mm -hmm. So I was curious to hear how you situate your understanding of the minor yeah. in relation to the same. That's interesting. That's like a mini lecture. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I, I think um, the way I see it is, is kind of Lovelaceian. I mean, Lovelace talks about uh, community effort. He talks about the fact that in the Caribbean, it's always been a case of us and them, us being poor black people and them being colonial rulers or whoever's in power, sort of bourgeoisie and stuff. So um, it's really about how a, a community of people produces a story, you know, how each one is invested along the way in a story, you know. So for instance, um, you know, uh, very quickly, uh, Lovelace has a story in uh, an episode in, um, his last book is it's just a movie in which, gosh, um, a man and a woman are having an argument. And I actually steal one of the lines, not the line, but the idea. A woman and a man are having an argument, and the woman has a parrot, and the parrot is flying around the room. And the man catches the parrot and takes it in a taxi. And as he's taking it in a taxi away, the parrot is cursing. <laughs> and the policeman comes and arrests the parrot. <laughs> and the policeman has a story. So you find out a little bit more about the policeman's story. And it goes through the book like that. So each character that's in content becomes, you know, has, uh, is invested in some way. I think it's about investment for me. Um, and how all the parts tie up. I don't actually um, think about a character being flat or a character being rounded. I just try to write good characters each time. I just try to write characters that are memorable. And sometimes they take on lives of their own, and sometimes they don't. I guess those are minor characters, but no one is actually minor, you know. I mean, if you, in a political sense, you know, there are no minor characters. They're characters who get less attention in the book, but they still have lives. And within the the omnibus of the story, their lives are still going on. So uh, that's how I look at it. You know. I don't know if that answers your question. We're just at 7 o'clock, so um, thank you very, very much, Emily.